I told my tech friend back there I'd give him finger guns when I was ready to go, so I'm ready to go now. How's everybody doing? I haven't been on a reInvent stage in like two years, and I'm super excited to see everyone in person. It's fantastic. Uh, we have some people trickling in, but I think we can get started. Um, welcome to how Netflix is using IPv6 to enable hyperscale net uh, networking. Uh, my name is Rob Hilton. I'm a principal solutions architect with AWS. And very fortunately for all of you, you won't have to hear a whole lot from me today. Uh, I'm joined on stage, no less than six feet to my right, by Donovan Fritz, who is a senior networking SRE, and a brilliant one at that, who's helped us push the, ne the uh, limits of cloud networking today, and who's also helping pioneer some of the stuff that we're working toward building into for the next decade or so. Uh, some of you may know that Netflix started their cloud journey in about 2008, and at the scale of their business, I'm sure you can imagine how complex and nuanced maintaining an always-on resilient network in that type of state would be, and you would be correct. In this talk, Donovan is going to walk us through some of the things that got Netflix to where they are today, and some of the things that they're doing to work toward what they need to be where they need to be tomorrow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Donovan Fritz. All right, oh. All right thank you. Oh, is it on? Thanks, Rob, for that generous introduction. Again, my name is Donovan Fritz. Um, I do cloud networking at Netflix, and today we're going to be talking about how we are at Netflix using IPv6 to enable hyperscale networking. There we go. Perfect. OK, so we're going to start off a quick agenda before we get started. We're going to be spending the majority of the time talking about why we're doing this, um, why IPv6. And just to give a little sneak peek there, it's because the business really needs it now. So after why, we're going to discuss the co-innovation between Netflix and AWS in this space. We're going to talk a little bit about our progress and where we are today with using IPv6 in the cloud. I'll share some of my lessons learned and best practices, and then we'll wrap up by uh, communicating how y'all can get started using IPv6 in the, in the cloud, and what I think is most important, how to show that this is worthwhile to your business. So as Rob mentioned, we've been in the cloud for quite a long time, and so our story today starts at that time. Over 10 years ago, when Netflix started operating inside the cloud, we moved out of the data center and into AWS. And the landscape that AWS had at the time was very different from what exists today. There's no concept of VPCs, internal load balancers didn't exist. And so as innovators in this space, we had to build some foundations to enable us to, to work because this hadn't really been done before. So we had to solve the service discovery problem. How does one service find another service? After service discovery, we had to solve the load balancing problem. How do you load balance between services? So we have our own internal service discovery tool that's open sourced on GitHub called Eureka. And then we'd use client-side load balancing heavily. Um, again, another open source project called Ribbon on our GitHub page. So around the 2012 and 2013 timeframe, in addition to US East 1, we started using two additional regions, uh, US West 2 and EU West 1. And we did this for a variety of reasons. The main benefits by going into this uh, active, active, active model was that it gave us better redundancy, better resiliency, and in, in, in most cases, lower, lower latency for our customers. And what this enabled us to do was provide a better service to our customers. We started winning more of what we call these moments of truth. And as our customers continued to enjoy Netflix and continued to use our service, we grew. And again, this is still an EC2 classic. The network mode of EC2 classic is um, very simple and very basic. So if you haven't used EC2 Classic before, uh, the general concept there is that it's a flat network shared by all customers. So every uh, AWS customer gets a private IPv4 address, every customer gets a public IPv4 address, and uh, the network is simply transport and policy is laid on top with, with uh, AWS security groups. And then around the 2016 timeframe, we moved our entire service out of VPC and into, or, I'm sorry, out of EC2 Classic and into VPC. And when we made this transition, in order to make this as easy as possible for our services that depend on the network, we built VPC to really mirror how EC2 Classic was built. It's a flat network. So all of our VPCs have non-overlapping IP space. They're all peered together. We enable routing between all of our VPCs. We don't use any, any network segmentation. Uh, the, place in the, low, the, the place in the network where services are deployed doesn't really matter to us. Again, we, we think of the network as just transport, and we layer policy on top with security groups to allow or disallow communication. So in order to accomplish this, again, like I mentioned, we have to have non-overlapping IP space. Uh, we do this globally across all of our three regions. So 
um, in order to, to allow a globally routable network, we uh, have our own backbone. So we use Direct Connect to connect to each one of our regions. Um, and then we have non-overlapping IP space across three regions. And we, can, uh, we, we provide a network to our company where any node can communicate to any other node, uh, barring uh, policy, like security groups. And so we maintain this model of non-overlapping IP space, not only in the cloud, but also on-premise as well. So our colo facilities, our offices, what have you. In the past four to five years, we've been seeing an uptick in containers. And so now we don't think of our microservices within the cloud as a collection of EC2 instances. We think of them as a collection of nodes, where a node could either be a container or an EC2 instance. Again, to make this transition as easy as possible, we focus on making the network contract between a container and an EC2 VM the same. And so we use Titus as our uh, container infra infrastructure and management platform. Titus is, um, again, open sourced on our GitHub page. And what Titus allows us to do is it allows us to um, have that same network contract between containers and EC2 VMs. And again, this, this allows us to carry over a lot of things that we, we use today. So I mentioned client-side load balancing earlier. We can continue to use our, uh, those existing techniques pretty transparently as we move workloads from EC2 instances over to containers. Now, Titus itself is operating on top of EC2. So that orange box we see there itself is, is an EC2 instance. And so in order for Titus to allow containers to have VPC IP addresses, there's a lot of acrobatics around how, to, how many ENIs we can attach to an EC2 instance, how many IPs we can put on those ENIs. And it's a, it's a really big problem for us. These aren't, um, these aren't soft limits either. There's really hard limits, and we can't just call up our, 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 the AWS and, and ask for these limits to be increased because they're, they're hard and they're not, uh, not very flexible. Okay, so let's summarize what we've talked about so far. First, the flat network. And this is a carryover from EC2 Classic. We built VPC to mirror that. And one of the reasons why we did that is because we use client-side load balancing. And just to be clear, we actually like client-side load balancing quite a bit, and we put a lot of business logic in there. Client-side load balancing is really fundamental to how we do canaries and custom request routing, for example. We also talked about containers. We do an IP address per container. And this is, again, to maintain the same network posture as we do with EC2 instances. So that's where we've been in the network. And we also want to think about where we're going as a networking team. So what we see is we're continuing to grow. We're winning these moments of truth with our customers where they're choosing to spend their time with Netflix. What this means for us is we need to be able to accommodate more accounts, more VPCs in our infrastructure. We also see some on-premise use cases emerging. We're, we're also the largest studio in the world. We're building our own originals and our own content for our service. And what we're seeing is there are some use cases where we have to start pulling compute and storage closer to our creatives that are actually building our content. We launched mobile games earlier this year. Mobile games is interesting because it's something new for us. We don't yet have great line of sight into what exactly that means, but I want to make sure that I'm doing my job and preparing the network for anything. So I call these, these business requirements. I'm going to translate each one of those business requirements into a technical requirement here. So first off, the flat network. What this means for me as a member of the cloud networking team is that I need to be able to support hundreds of VPCs today, all while maintaining full IP reachability. We talked um, for containers, we need n number of IPs on an ENI. How many IPs can we put on an ENI? And in some cases, these are really short-lived. The fastest I've ever seen a container come up, use the network, and go away is five seconds. That's five seconds where an IP was needed, allocated, used, and then went away. So these, uh, this is really incredibly dynamic. Um, so N, N IPs per ENI, uh, the more IPs we can put on an ENI, the more efficient we become with containers, the more efficient our business becomes as our overall container platform becomes more efficient. We think of this less as a container requirement. So containers are driving how we use ENIs. And so this is more of an ENI density requirement. And we'll refer to it as ENI density for the remainder of this talk. As we continue to grow, we need to change our mindset. We're no longer thinking about 100 plus VPCs. We're thinking 1,000 VPCs, thousands of VPCs. How can we maintain a network to support this all while having full IP reachability? And the on-premise use case is similar. We want to be able to achieve on-premise um, 
full IP reachability as well. Again, really teasing apart transport versus policy, we want to layer policy on top of our network and enable our network to just be uh, simple transport. So we've identified some flaws with our current approach, and our current approach being the exclusive use of private IPv4. First, the flat network. It's actually not that flat. We have this concept of public and private IPv4 addressing, and in some cases, we'll see services will select public IPs when they really should have been selecting the private IPs, and traffic will go out a NAT gateway and loop back into our VPC. This is suboptimal for a number of reasons. It's costly because NAT gateways are, are not super cheap, um, and then it adds latency and has some bandwidth restrictions as well. Overall, there's just a lot of room for improvement there. For ENI density, I mentioned the ENI limits, or not ENI, well, AWS limits in general. So again, how many uh, ENIs can we attach to a compute node? How many IPs can we put on those ENIs? And then how fast can we change those? Again, five seconds is incredibly fast. If we have to uh, contact the AWS API every time we want to use an IP, assign it to an ENI, and then have it go away, we actually can't mutate the network that fast at our scale. So what we end up doing is we end up predictively caching ENIs or predictively caching IPs that we think we're going to need really very soon. And then this creates an accounting problem. This is starting to snowball here. Now we need to be able to think about the life cycle of IP address. What was an IP address at a particular point in time? And there are some, additionally, there are some workloads where we want to attach an EIP directly to a container. So an EIP is an elastic IP address. It's really a public IPv4 address. The way the contract works with the AWS API is we, we take uh, an EIP and we associate it to a private address. And so what we'll see is that if we want to start a workload using a public IPv4 address, if we start it too soon after that association was successful, we have intermittent connectivity. So there's a propagation delay problem here as well. And it gets uh, more and more challenging the more and more we use that te technique. So more flaws with our continued growth. We're concerned around routing limits. So I mentioned today we're around the 100-ish VPC limit. Um, and we can accommodate a full a network with full IP reachability using VPC peering. But as we continue to grow, we know we're going to have to do something about that. As we create and move more VPCs, we actually predict that we're going to accelerate our, our IPv4 uh, address exhaustion problem. So the more places in the network you have, the more address space you allocate, the less efficient you become with that address space overall. The on-premise story is similar. Uh, we're concerned about address exhaustion. Again, that theme of you know, more places in the network, the less efficient you are overall. But then we're also concerned about routing limits. But in this, in this case, it's less about VPC peering and more about direct connect. How do we direct connect all of these VPCs to provide reachability on-premise? How, you know, how many VIFs can we put on a, a direct connect? Um, how, how can we you know, scale uh, direct connect gateways, those sort of things? And so what we did was we asked ourselves, what are we going to do? We realized these problems were coming at us a few years ago, and we collectively thought, as our team, you know, what are we going to do here? And so anytime we're faced with these really large architectural decisions, what we end up doing is partnering with AWS. As Rob mentioned earlier at the start, we've been in AWS for a number of years, since around the 2008 mark. AWS has been a great partner with us for this so far. And we know they're going to continue to be a great partner with us as we move forward. So when we opened up this dialogue, we started talk, tossing out some ideas. The first idea being this EC2 classic mode of operation. So we thought, you know, we, we're, we're seeing some problems continuing to grow. Could we go back to this EC2 classic model? We've done this before, we thought. The general idea here is that we'll stop caring about private IPv4 addresses. We'll give everything a public IPv4 address and just communicate through the IGW. Again, we've, we've done this before. We've we fundamentally operated the streaming service in this mode in the past. What happened, though, is that once we moved into VPC, we started using containers, and we added this ENI density constraint that we didn't have back then. And so this model doesn't address that constraint that we now have. In fact, it actually makes it worse because of that EIP update like problem I mentioned earlier. So this is a no-go. The next idea we considered was what I like to call tiny bubbles. So we think about VPCs as bubbles or islands. And if you want to interconnect the VPCs, you have to use private link, which is just a combination of VPC endpoints and NLBs. And so you have really explicit interconnection points between your VPCs. You stop caring about non-overlapping IP space across your VPCs. 
And it's a great way to continue to scale. Again, it's a well-defined pattern. The issues with this is client-side load balancing is so critical to our business that moving to this model means that we have to start putting NLBs between our services, which is a form of server-side load balancing, which doesn't work well for us. It also doesn't address this Ian identity constraint that I mentioned earlier. It, it just keeps it the status quo. In fact, no idea that we, can, we talked about in these conversations, no, there, there's no option here to, to solve this particular challenge. And I recognize that all solutions um, are a compromise to some degree. But I have an idea here. Before I focused on cloud networking, I did what I would call traditional networking. I worked in data center environments. And there's a design pattern from those days of old that I'm, that I'm recognizing and pulling forward here. So if I ask myself, how would I solve this problem in a traditional network, I would route a network block to a host. We'd send a CIDR block to a particular compute node. And so we thought to ourselves, could we do something similar inside AWS? So conceptually, what we want to accomplish is we want to move from this, assigning individual IPv4 addresses to an elastic network interface, and move to a model where we assign a prefix, a CIDR block, to uh, a single ENI. And we were actually talking with the AWS service teams about that right here, in Re right here at reInvent in Vegas in 2019. And when we were sketching this out on the back of a napkin, we titled it prefix delegation, and we've been talking about it in that way ever since. And I'm really excited because four months ago, this actually became a reality. Now, Joe Meg was generous enough to let me put his tweet on the board here. And I, I wanted to do this because I think his words describe it best. This is a big deal. Being able to assign an IPv4 and or an IPv6 prefix directly to an ENI is a game changer for containers, which is exactly the pain point that we have today. A slight side effect, um, I, I mentioned earlier that you know, all solutions are a compromise, and this is no different. So a slight side effect of using uh, this, this new primitive prefix delegation is that we become overall less efficient with our IP space. In some cases, we may need to assign a single IP, or four or six, to, uh, to a particular ENI. And with prefix delegation, we're, we're really hard-coded and we're set on, on a set amount. And so we need to ask ourselves, if we want to buy all into this technique, how much IP space do we need? So let's think about that. The three primary uh, address ranges that folks generally use in VPCs today are the RFC 1918, your 10 slash 8, 172.16/12, 192.168/16, .12, and so we have those up on their board. The size of the box is the respective size compared to each other. For a variety of reasons that go back to when we initially moved the streaming service out of EC2 Classic and into VPC, we started using an, an additional uh, address range. So this is RFC 6598. It's 164 slash 10. It works equally as well for private IPv4 addressing inside AWS or on-premise. Um, OK, so I mentioned earlier that we maintain non-overlapping IP space across our entire enterprise. And so what I've done here is I've marked off on the board the, the IP space that is used on-premise. And now, uh, in, in gray, is the IP space that we're currently using inside VPC. And then uh, the space in black is used for future allocation. So we'll put the two full blocks aside, the two smaller ones, and we'll just focus on IP planning using the, the open space here. So first and foremost, a single prefix is 16 IPs. A slash 28 doesn't really register on the radar. Uh, when we're thinking about what is the upper bound for how many IPs we might need on an ENI, we came up with a 64 number. So that's four prefixes on an ENI, 64 IPs, a slash 26. When we're just looking at one of those, it, it has no impact in our overall IP planning. Where things get interesting is we think about how many elastic network interfaces we might need in a particular availability zone. So we landed on this 8K number, and we start to see some, some real big movement in terms of growth. So in order to satisfy this, we're looking at half a million IP addresses, which would be summarizable into a slash 13. Now that's just one zone. I didn't mention this earlier, but we only operate our streaming service in regions that have at least three availability zones. So we need to multiply that you know, uh, four prefixes per ENI, 8K prefixes in a zone, multiplied by three, three zones per region. We take that half million IPs, we get a million and a half IPs. Um, in order to accomplish this, we would need an open slash 12 and a slow slash 13, which we have, we can do that. This is just one region now. I mentioned we have three regions. So as we multiply that by three regions, we switch from 
you know, a million and a half IPs to needing four and a half million IPs. So now we would need a slash 10 and a slash 13. We could do, uh, we're out of space here. So this, this blue, these three blue boxes below the 10 slash eight, um, that's IP space that we'd, we would need, but we don't have. We're out of addresses at this point. And I recognize that we're, we're being fairly, um, very generous with, with our calculations here. So we could probably do something. We're a little bit over for our current size. Um, but again, this is just our current size. We need to accommodate future growth. And my knee-jerk reaction would just be to double it. If I can't support doubling the size of my network, I don't think I'm doing a good enough job to be working at, at Netflix. So if we were to double it, we move from you know, being a little bit over to something that we could do to just being grossly over. You know, we, we need to do something here. We know that the numbers aren't going to work out for us. Oh, I'm going to go back. OK, so I do need to caveat that, this a little bit, because these are not the exact numbers that we used internally for IP planning. I was advised that using the exact numbers would uh, showcase our exact size um, as a company. Uh, so what we're doing here, though, is we're showing a general progression, because at the end of the day, this is showing the same result as what we came to internally. When we're asking how much IP space do we need, the answer is a lot. And I don't think it's any, any guess where we're going here next with this next logic step. We need IPv6. We need IPv6 to accommodate our future growth, but also to accommodate our container density on ENIs. And so conceptually, when we go back to thinking about ENI density, we want to move from this model with individual IPs and IPv4 prefixes to this model, thinking about individual IPv6 addresses and an IPv6 prefix. Now, we've been on quite a bit of a journey here. I think we're down a bit of a rabbit hole. We started talking about our, our network growing, and you know, we started adding containers and how that's putting pressure on the network and ENI density, and we think we can solve this with, with, um, with prefix delegation, but we're going to run out of IPs. So what I want to do here is I want to pull our heads above, back up above water. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to solve problems for the business. And I want to make sure that we're still on track. Because again, we're trying to solve problems for the business. So we need to ask the question, does IPv6 solve our business network requirements that we were talking about earlier? So with the flat network, absolutely. IPv6 is a single address space. We don't have this concept of public and private anymore and no NAT, which is great. We don't have that awkward transition of you know, things going out in NAT gateway, for example. Now, the first time I mention this to somebody, usually what I hear is, well, well we need NAT. We need NAT to protect us against you know, things on the internet. And that's not true. Uh, NAT was, and NAT is not, and never was intended to be used as any sort of security barrier. What is used as a security barrier is a stateful firewall. Now, typically today, what we see is that NAT and firewalls are, are bundled together in implementation. So firewalls, NAT gateways, for example, it's doing NATing and firewalling. What we actually care about, though, for this concern around protecting ourselves from the internet is the firewall concept. And AWS also provides a primitive to be able to accomplish this. So the egress-only internet gateway, or EIGW, is a, is a complementary technique that, or primitive, I should say, um, that allows us to have uh, internal or private subnets that can send out to the internet but won't receive connectivity inwards um, from you know, the general internet. Anyway, flat network, no NAT, great with v6. Prefix delegation, ENI density. We talked about this quite a bit, and again, this is multifaceted. Prefix delegation not only solves our, our concern with how many IPs we can put on an ENI, but also with how fast we can change it. So prefix delegation allows us to do a single control plane operation, set up the prefix to an ENI, and then we're free to churn those IPs as much as we want after that. This two-for-one combination, again, is really powerful and the reason why we want to move forward with this technique. So continued growth. We talked about address exhaustion earlier. Um, this is a 300-level course. I hope everybody understands that the V6 address space is sufficiently large so we don't worry about this anymore. What we haven't talked about yet, though, is our concerns around routing limits. How do we actually interconnect all of our VPCs in this type of hypothetical world we're talking about so far? So let's think about that a bit. The first way I ever connected two VPCs together was with this concept of a customer gateway, or CGW. 
And the way this generally works is you create a VPN tunnel to VPC A, you create a VPN tunnel to VPC B, and you route traffic between your VPCs using your on-premise equipment. It has a lot of drawbacks. It's you know, costly and has uh, administrative, costly in terms of administrative overhead to set up, it has some throughput limitations, a lot of latency there. But it is, in fact, an option to interconnect VPCs. Um, the, the, way that, the next way Amazon provided um, an option for connecting VPCs using private IPv4 was with VPC peering. VPC peering is really cool because it's not so much a thing that you send traffic through, but more of a permission set is how I generally think about it. So it's, it, it, um, it scales super well in terms of you know, bandwidth and packets per second. Um, it's super, super cost efficient. But it has a relatively low upper bound in terms of how many VPCs you can interconnect. I believe the limit's at 125 today. And so if we're thinking about going above that limit, we really need to start thinking about Transit Gateway. Transit Gateway bumps that limit up quite high, moves from hundreds to thousands. I believe the limit's 5,000 today. And so when you're, when you're thinking about that scale, Transit Gateway is really the, the way forward there. Now, a drawback of Transit Gateway is that you, you have, it's, it's costly to maintain traffic. It's actually being sent through a thing today with how Transit Gateway is implemented. Um, so there's bandwidth restrictions. There's a little bit extra latency increase. And it costs more than VPC peering. Um, but what we're talking about here, if I, if I stand back again and, and I think about the themes that we're talking about, is we're talking about ways to explicitly interconnect VPCs. I have to do a thing as an engineer. Well, what I actually want is I actually just want to accomplish my outcome. And the outcome that I want to accomplish is I want the things inside the VPCs to communicate. I actually don't care how that's done. We, had, we talked about an option earlier with the Amazon EC2 Classic model, where we could have a network set up by not setting up a network. Just allow overlapping IP space in our VPCs, send traffic out to IGW, really lean into public IP connectivity. This works well for public IPv4 reachability, but it doesn't work for private IPv4 reachability. But with respect to IPv6, IPv6 is, is considered public in this regard. So we now have another option to interconnect our VPCs with IPv6 that we don't have with private IPv4. And I think this is really underthought of as an option to uh, interconnect your VPCs these days. Um, yes. So when we go back to thinking about how, how uh, IPv6 can solve our business requirements, we move from thinking about uh, having to explicitly set up our network to having this option to implicitly set up our network. I don't have to explicitly configure a thing or do something. I get implicit reachability just by using IPv6. Now, I recognize there might be some reasons to do that explicit setup if you need to use security group references, for example. But for some workloads, we actually don't need to do that. It might be fine. You could go the extreme of doing a workload per VPC, for example. Um, anyway, the, the key takeaway here is that we have another option that we don't with IPv4. And the on-premise story is similar. We end up not having to have explicit setup. I don't have, if I don't have to direct connect all my VPCs, I think that's fantastic. For our IPv6, we can set up one public direct connect with one public VIF, and we can have reachability into all of our VPCs. That, that's super cool to me. So what we're seeing here is that IPv6 is starting to check some boxes. There's a lot of business value. We're seeing a lot of business value in moving to IPv6. And so what we need to do is we need to think about, is this is actually something we want to do at Netflix as a company? And the key here is, is as a company, because there are a number of things that a lot of folks are going to have to do at Netflix to be able to support V6. So what I did as part of my job is I went out and I talked to all my fellow engineering teams, and I did what we call farming for dissent. So I'm talking to these engineering teams, trying to figure out if, there's, if I'm missing something. From my standpoint, IPv6 seems to be ticking a lot of boxes. We should do this. Am I missing something? Is there any reason why we must hit the red button and figure out a different solution? Because I don't see it yet. And in these conversations, again, I couldn't find a reason. So we ended up hitting the green button. And we decided to, as an, engineering community, as an engineering community at Netflix, move forward with IPv6. Now, we know we wouldn't, we knew that we would not be successful in this endeavor without partnering in co-innovation with AWS. And the first part of co-innovation, I've already mentioned a time or two, prefix delegation. The ability to assign a prefix to an ENI. 
What I haven't talked about yet is why it's a slash 80. And that's an interesting story that I think I should give some airtime to. So from past experience, if you were to you know, route a network block to a compute host using a v6, generally it would be a slash 64. It's, it's a lot more common. Um, but when we looked at what it would take to actually accomplish that using the existing AWS primitives, the math didn't really work. So a VPC today is a slash 56. Um, we, out of a slash 56, you get 256 slash 64s. And from our earlier session, when we were talking through private IPv4 address exhaustion, we know we need thousands of these things. So something has to give there. So we gave uh, a different consideration. You know, what if we move the bit boundary a bit over? We'll move it you know, from 64 to slash 80, one hex ted over. And things start to look a little bit different. So now within a particular VPC subnet, you can have uh, 65,000 of these. So between 64 and 80 is 16 bits, 2 to the 16 is 65K. Um, so in every single VPC subnet now, uh, you get 65,000 prefixes in terms of optionalities for, for assigning to ENIs. The downside, what you're giving up there, is you're giving up the amount of unique IPs per ENI. And really, the difference between 64 and 80 is, is pretty minimal. So a slash 80 is uh, 48 bits left in the address, so 2 to the 48, or between 80 and 128, you get 48 bits. Um, so 2 to the 48th is a number that I don't have memorized. Um, but that's the, same, that's the same bit space as MAC addresses, as you know, hardware addresses on network interfaces. So in terms of order of magnitude, we're, we're now in a situation where we have as many unique IPs on every single ENI as there are unique MAC addresses in the world. It's virtually limitless. And the amount of increased limitless from slash 80 to 64, uh, we get a lot of diminishing returns there. So anyway, slash 80 landed on that. Uh, an open issue that I want to talk about a bit is around transition mechanism. So IPv6 and IPv4 are not directly compatible. You need to do a thing to allow something that's v6 only to communicate to something that's v4 only. And what we're interested in at Netflix is driving for IPv6 only containers. And so we need to think about how can we provide a backwards compatibility layer for things that are v4 only. The industry standard way to accomplish this is with DNS 6.4 and NAT 6.4. Quick overview of how this works. Uh, for our particular case, a container that's running v6 only will reach oh, our container that's running v6 only will reach out um, and ask for a DNS record, and we'll do the, D, uh, the v6 compatible record lookup. The DNS 6.4 service will recognize that it only supports IPv4, and then we'll synthesize a response. Um, and in that response, it'll put the route or the destination to the NAT 6.4 gateway or instance. And so when the container uh, tries to uh, send a packet, it'll, reach th uh, it'll send the packet to the NAT64. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, that response from DNS64 will also have the ultimate IPv4 destination as well. They're, they're both encoded in that response. Um, and then in the NAT64 will move the segment data from v6 to v4, and the packet goes on its merry way. In order to use this technique, um, you're, you're required to use DNS. And so what I mentioned at the beginning of this talk is we couldn't rely on DNS when the streaming, when our product offering started, so we don't rely on DNS for inter-service communication. So we don't have that hook to be able to use this technique. Um, that's probably solvable, though. You know, I, I have a lot of you know, incredibly talented folks at Netflix, and I think this could actually be solvable. But what's more difficult, though, is how security group references work. So again, our, we, we really think about our network in terms of transport versus policy. So we provide a, a simple transport network, and we layer policy on top of security groups. And so anytime we have something that obfuscates that, that's a problem for us. NAT gateways and NAT64, when you send packets through them, they fundamentally lose your security group context. So now we lose the ability to do security group references, which is something that we do so much at Netflix. So this was such a problem for us that we actually decided to innovate in this area ourselves. So again, in the similar type of setup, what we do is instead of relying on NAT64 to provide that, uh, that transition between uh, v6 and v4, we just run a transition mechanism on every single uh, compute node, our, our tightest compute infrastructure again. And so in this particular uh, situation, we can have a container that's IPv6 only, but the ENI that's attached to our uh, compute node, our, our Titus uh, EC2 instance, will be dual stacked. It will have both a, an IPv6, IPv6 prefix and an IPv4 address. And so this transition mechanism will then allow 
uh, that communication to go out. Now, it's still a transition mechanism. Oh, and security group references work because we're you know, co-tended on the same uh, ENI and security groups are at the ENI. Um, so I mentioned that this is a transition mechanism. It's not implemented as NAS64 and, and DNS64. It uh, uses what we call internally as uh, the TSA or the Titus syscall agent. It's providing the same functionality, uh, but it's done at the syscall layer. Uh, it's, it's a bit more of a novel approach. Um, our team did an entire presentation on just this, uh, this one component earlier this year at the Linux Plumbers Conference. Um, and the short link to be able to view that presentation is up on the screen there, so it's bit .ly slash NF nflx dash TSA. So if you're interested for how we're um, solving this transition mechanism problem while uh, maintaining security group references to work, I, I encourage everybody to check that out. Now again, it's specific to Titus, um, but we are hoping to open source this uh, in the future. But right now it's still um, only at Netflix. Okay, so I wanna switch gears a bit and talk about our progress so far going towards IPv6. The techniques that I talked about so far are the techniques that we're uh, moving forward with as a company. So today at Netflix, we are using IPv6. We have used prefix delegation in production. Kind of hoping for some claps. There we go, all right, there we go. Thank you, thank you. And so for us, we've been focusing just on IPv6 only containers. And by driving just that use case, we've driven 25% IPv6 adoption as measured by unique network flows inside of our VPCs. And to quantify that a bit more, we started this calendar year, 2021, with less than 1%. So that's quite a, big, quite a bit of growth in a very short amount of time. We've learned a lot in this process, and I wanna share some of those lessons learned with you all today. <laughs> I got more, more applause and more laugh on, on that. Cool. So it doesn't sound like that's contentious. Um, old code is, is definitely not fun, especially Java. What I see time and time again is that developers are you know, tuning the JVM to explicitly disable IPv6 or at least prefer IPv4. And the streaming service, the Netflix streaming service, is primarily built in Java. And so you can imagine how widespread this issue is. When I look in our internal code repository to the first time I ever saw this actually being committed, it lined up with when IPv6 was enabled on the corporate network. And at this time, IPv6 was relatively new. This was you know, over 10 years ago. And the commit message is something like, you know, I saw IPv6 on the corporate network today. This library broke, disabling v6. And I don't, I don't blame them at all. Like, I would probably do the same thing. At the end of the day, they're building software to support the business, and the network broke them, and they need to move forward. So that's great, I don't blame them. But what's tricky, though, is that those libraries that broke back then are fixed now, and so unwinding that is the challenge. My next lesson learned that I wanna share with you all today is that assigning IPv6 to a node doesn't actually mean it's gonna be used. So similar to the Java problem, right, like the JVM is explicitly preferring v4 over v6, um, but once we fix that, we, we end up seeing another problem. We'll operate, we operate nodes inside Netflix with sidecars, and these sidecars are generally very independent from the workloads, and what we'll see is that if we, if we fix this JVM problem, for example, and the, the, this Java service is using both v6 for ingress and egress, um, we'll have sidecars on that node that are still preventing it from moving to a, a dual stack stage operating with both v6 and v4 to going to IPv6 only. So when you're thinking about how to move to v6 only, you can't just think about the workload itself. You have to think about the entire compute node, everything that's running on that sidecar, sidecars included. The next one is that happy eyeballs masks IPv6 problems. So happy eyeballs for those of you who may not be aware, is an IETF standard for given preference to IPv6 while still allowing fallback to IPv4. Now don't get me wrong, this is great. This was required and needed to gain the level of IPv6 adoption that we have on the internet today. But we're using IPv6 in a data center environment, not over the general internet, and we see different results with happy eyeballs. So again, in VPC, we have tight control over the network, the TCP clients, the TCP servers, and in Happy Eyeballs uh, provides a, is, is a fallback there. And um, you know, we, we believe in IPv6. We believe in IPv6 so much that we don't want this fallback. Because this fallback, um, 
is another like if statement. It's something that we have to consider in terms of our resiliency exercises. Um, it's something that should be regularly exercised. And so again, we believe in IPv6 so much that we actually went through and we disabled um, happy eyeballs on some of our largest IPC platforms. And what this does is it, it, it provides a strong stance saying like, we believe in IPv6. If there's an IPv6 problem, it is a network problem that needs to be fixed. My next lesson learned is how little IPv6 support there, there is today for all these AWS managed services. I was kind of hoping for another, ooh, ah. Uh, What, wasn't or what was more surprising to me, though, was how many of these AWS services we use at Netflix. So if you think about things like RDS, ElastiCache, DynamoDB, all those great products that Amazon provides, very few of them support IPv6 today. And this is what makes the transition mechanism so important for us. Because for those things that operate inside VPC, like ElastiCache, RDS, we can use, still use security group references with how we've implemented the transition mechanism to allow us to move to IPv6 at our own pace, while still allowing these AWS managed services to get with the program at some point. All right, so I want to share some of my best practices with you all today. First and foremost, communication. Now, I mentioned earlier that as part of my job, I went through and I farmed for dissent. I tried to figure out if there was a reason why we shouldn't use v6 at Netflix. And something interesting happened in that process that I didn't see right away, but I see now. So as part of that process, what I did was I socialized the problems that we're seeing at the network layer, and it kind of gave a heads up to all these different teams that they can expect to see IPv6 coming more and more. And what this did is it changes, it changes an equation. It changes a, a way of thinking. So now when developers are seeing IPv6 show up in logs, and there's a log parser that has only ever seen a v4 address in this spot, and now breaks because there's a v6 address in this spot, it changes that thought equation from the network broke my thing to, oh, I can expect this. This is happening, and I need to go fix that right now. So the communication up front is really powerful because it changes that equation down the road. My next best practice would be to give serious consideration for bring your own IP. So BYOIP, bring your own IP, is the ability to use your public IPv6 addresses um, inside AWS. And the reason why this is important at least for Netflix, we, we ran into this. So we have centralized services where we just want to have a network policy that's, you know, allow anything to communicate to me. I don't care what exactly you are, but if you're a Netflix node, you can come in and you can talk to me. With IPv4, that's, that's actually quite easy to do because the address space is summarizable. You can put a 10 slash 8 or for us 164 slash 10 rule in there to allow everything in. But with IPv6, by default, you will... By default, if you use the Amazon provided IP space, um, that address space is discontiguous. So where you could put a you know, one line entry in there to cover your entire um, enterprise, now you're, you're looking at doing one line per VPC. And the limitless scale of IPv6 means you're going to run into that limit incredibly fast. So you know, definitely give some, some consideration there um, for those of you pursuing v6. My next best practice is to now, overlay v6 with v4. Recognize that you don't need to move to IPv6 all at once. You can overlay v6 and v4, take your time, move traffic over slowly, um, and get used to it. So then when you're doing that, make sure that you match your IPv4 range rules with the corresponding IPv6 range rules. So in the similar situation where I was talking about a security group that allows in your entire enterprise, if you only have that for v4 and not for v6, you're kind of hurting yourself because you'll, you'll put out this, this, poly, this stance where you know, V4 works, but V6 doesn't, and that doesn't help our cause at all. So um, as, your, as your first um, best practice, like, make sure you go through your security groups, and if you're using IP range rules, make sure they're updated with corresponding V6 and V4 networks. Okay, so I really hope that everybody is thinking in this audience, how do I get started? The first step, or actually I would say step zero, is to get IPv6 working on your development machines, your workstations. Think about your corporate environment, your home office, your corporate VPNs. Those are generally the areas today that are lacking IPv6 the most. You should start there, focus on those areas first. After that, go through and enable IPv6 on your edge. 
So um, if you're using an ALB or an NLB, it's one click in the AWS console to turn on IPv6. Uh, two things to keep in mind there is to update security groups. If you have an IPv4 all rule, make sure you have the corresponding IPv6 all rule. Um, uh, DNS-wise, if you're using RAW53 alias records, uh, make sure you have a quad A in addition to, to the A record to, to enable v6 there. Um, at that point, then start focusing on your workloads in VPC. Again, overlay IPv6 with IPv4. Realize that you don't have to move everything at the same time. Overlay it, get comfortable. And then my recommendation is to consider working from the edge inwards. So generally, the edge of your network, the, uh, facing, your, your, uh, facing the internet, you're facing your customers, has the most concrete set of network dependencies. So picking out that area to, um, to focus on v6 adoption um, has worked well for us. Um, and this is in contrast to like looking from the data, data persistence layer up, for example. All right, so I saved the last question for last. Oh, actually, I want to go back and mention one more thing. So my stunning colleague, Joel Kadama, is doing a chalk talk that goes into much more detail on this section entirely. So his talk is uh, later this week. It's NFX 401. And I highly encourage everybody to check that out. All right. Now, how do you show IPv6 is worthwhile to your business? I hope you've been seeing a common theme here in, in the way that I'm talking today, is that this is a business requirement. It's required for Netflix to continue to grow. It's not because IPv6 is cool or because I want to use it. It's because the business needs it. It's, it comes down to simple economics. So first off, IPv6 is faster than IPv4. I'm not here to you know, debate the merits of this, but you can go online and, and just Google this sentence and find lots of great articles. Um, anyway, so IPv6 is faster than IPv4. So if you don't at least have IPv6 enabled on your edge, your, you know, your edge ALBs and NLBs, you're probably penalizing your customers, your users of your service. And there's an economic and business advantage to providing a faster service. And what we're generally seeing today is that IPv6 is faster because of how many NATs there are in the world. So think about your, your home router NAT, your NAT in your corporate environment, your, you know, your edge firewalls in your office. Um, NAT gateways as well are an example of, of, of a NAT. Um, and then there's lots of carry grade NATs as, as well within ISPs networks. And what we're seeing is that these NATs are an expensive boundary. They're providing a, a, a performance penalty for IPv4 versus IPv6. But it's, it's also expensive. It's expensive for a couple of reasons. Excuse me. Public IPv4s are also, um, uh, they're a scarce resource. So what we see today is like elastic IPs are more expensive under certain circumstances. Um, and, and what this means is that we end up optimizing to reduce the use of public IPv4s. And so we have that, that expensive boundary between using NAT gateways and, and public IPv4s. Um, the tiny bubbles model that I mentioned earlier also optimizes to reduce the use of public IPv4s. Um, the theme here is that we're seeing is that these, these models, um, they introduce middle boxes. They introduce things in the network to process packets to reduce the, to, to either continue the growth of private IPv4 and allow overlaps, um, or to, in general, reduce the use of public IPv4 addresses. And these middle boxes you know, add costs. NAT gateways, I think there are some folks maybe in this audience that are you know, very adamant about how expensive NAT gateways can be. Um, they, also add they also add operational risk. You know, the, the NLBs and the private link approach require DNS tricks in order to use. So what we're seeing today is that the, extending the life of IPv4 um, is, 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 in general, putting lots of NATs and lots of middle boxes in your network. And what I want is I want just a simple flat network that's just simply transport. And NATs have broken that. They've broken that model, and I just, I just really want it back. So at Netflix, what we've been doing is we've been starting the journey to IPv6 and VPC, and so should you. What you're going to see is that the cost of maintaining an IPv6 network is going to grow super linearly as you continue to grow in the cloud. You can either proactively address that today, or you can be a victim to that change later. So that's it.
That's all I have for y'all today. Uh, thank you. My, my contact information is up on the screen um, for anybody who wants to chat more on this topic. Um, I am also compelled to invite everybody to complete the session survey. Um, I will personally read all your feedback, so you know, don't hold back and be honest, uh, because at the end of the day, it's going to help me be a better presenter and provide better content in the future. So again, you know, thank everybody.